Hello everyone. Um, this is the last video that covers content for the semester. I'm going to make you a few more videos um, about how we do kinetics and the experimentation, the experimental part of kinetics experiments um, and kind of what actual data looks like. But these are more for those of you who are doing kinetics research. So that means working with me or um, Dr. C or Dr. M. Um, and so this video, after you finish this video, you will have all the information that you need to finish your homework and to prepare for the last exam. So let's get started. In this video, we are going to talk about what's called pseudo first order reactions. Um, this is covered very, very briefly in 14.2 in your textbook. Um, I am using the textbook Chemical Kinetics and Reaction Dynamics by Paul Houston um, for this material. Okay, so what are pseudo first order reactions? A lot of reactions that we do are two reactants, two different reactants coming together to form products. Um, in fact, most of the reactions that we do would be classified this way. And so for these reactions, we would write the rate law as the rate of change of A with respect to T is our rate constant times the concentration of A times the concentration of B. But what we do is in this rate law, we have too many things changing. So as the course of the reaction proceeds, A and B change. And that becomes very difficult to measure. And so what we do is we conduct this experiment at a high concentration of one of our reactants. Let's, for this example, we are going to say B. And so this could be a high pressure, a like a filled atmosphere, um, think a oxygen saturated atmosphere or a hydrogen saturated atmosphere or this could be at a high concentration and when I say high concentration we are talking that the concentration of B is about 500 times greater than the concentration of A minimum so we're talking a lot more concentrated. And what that means is that B is so concentrated that its concentration during the course of the reaction is basically constant. And so that means that our concentration of B at any given time point is approximately equal to the initial concentration. And this allows us to rearrange the differential rate law so that B is now over with K and T, and we, instead of using B at some time, we are using the initial concentration of B. And so now, this is where we were at the end of the last slide. Now we solve our rate law the way that we've solved our rate law before. We go from the differential to the integrated, and so we integrate both sides. And if A is a first order, then we get this form of the integrated rate law. And notice that in this integrated rate law, 
we have our initial concentration of B. If we were not treating this as pseudo first order, or if our concentration of B was not high enough and it was changing during the reaction, this integral would be much more complicated. And I showed you the answer to that, um, ex that integrated rate law in um, a few slides back, at, or a few videos back at the beginning of chapter 14. So if the reaction is first order with respect to A, then what we can do is graph this integrated rate law where we're graphing the, con the natural log of the concentration of A versus time. And now our slope is going to be equal to the rate constant times the initial concentration of B. Now, what we just worked through was under the assumption that we knew that the stoichiometry of that reaction was basically one to one, or at least that the reaction was first order with respect to A. So now I'm going to walk you through the steps of solving this problem in a more generic way. And so if we don't know the stoichiometry of this reaction. And so our rate law is more unknown. We don't know the order of the reaction with respect to A or B. We can still run this reaction at a high concentration of B, but we get a different expression for our integrated rate law. I'm sorry, for our rearrangement of our differential rate law, which will lead to a different answer for the integrated rate law. So when we have this sort of problem, the first thing that we really have to do is we have to determine the order of, of one of our reactants. And that reactant is going to be the one that we don't have a high concentration of. So it's the one that we're monitoring. So if we were to, so we worked out the differential rate law on the last slide. The next step will be to integrate that. But we don't know what a to the x is. We don't know what x is. And so what we do is we experimentally figure that out. And so we collect the data of measuring the concentration of A at a variety of times, and then we experimentally determine the order by fitting that data to both first and second order reactions. And our question is, which one is a better model? And the better model is the one with a better fit of the data to the model. And so to do that, we say, well, what if x equals 1? Well, if that's the case, we get this integrated rate law. And if x is equal to 2, we get this integrated rate law. And so if you notice, that means that we graph... Ooh, different things on the y-axis. And this time I'm saying, I'm calling the slope k observed because really it is going to be equal to k times b initial raised to some power. And we don't know what that power is yet, but that power is going to be the same. And so we can say that this for that power is going to be constant over the course of this over the course of the reaction. And so really we can think about the slope as sort of a combined k term or k observed. Once we know the order of a, then we have to determine the order of b. 
And so to do this, we are going to repeat this experiment. So the experiment that we did first was measuring the concentration of A at different times at an initial concentration of B equaling some large number. Let's say that this equals 500 times our concentration of A, our initial concentration of A. Well, what we need to do is we need to repeat this experiment. So we are going to measure A with respect to time again, but this time our initial concentration of B is maybe, say, 750 times the con initial concentration of A. So we're running B at a different concentration. And so that means that this, remember that this K observed is equal to K times the initial concentration of B raised to some power. And so that means that our K, because we are using different concentrations of B, we will get two different values for K observed for these two experiments. And what that lets us do is it allows us to set up this ratio where we think about experiment one, let's call this experiment one, and experiment two, and we can make a ratio of this K observed equation between experiment one and experiment two, and using the relationship, we can solve for y and learn the order of the reaction with respect to b. We're not quite done yet because what we have measured is not k. We have measured k observed. And what we have, and we have this relationship for K observed, and remember from step two, we found Y equals a number. Hopefully a nice, easy number. So once we know Y, we can use this relationship of K observed equals K times the, con the initial concentration of B raised to some power, and with that, from one of our experiments, it doesn't matter which one, we can find the actual value of k. And this k is our actual rate constant. And that means the rate constant is the, is the value of this rate no matter what concentrations of A and B we mix together. Whereas remember that K observed changes with concentration of B. And so therefore it is not our true rate constant. Rather it's our convenient way of trying to isolate these variables and these parameters so that we can, we can find the order of reaction of each of our species independently. Okay, so with that, you should be able to do all of the homework problems um, and be able to study for the exam. The next videos that I'm going to post over tonight and tomorrow are going to be extra information um, for you and things, applications of kinetics and how kinetics actually is done in the research laboratory.